Welcome back guys. This is Jason, KM4ACK. Today, let's take a look at setting up an APRS Digipeter. Stick around and we'll get right to it. Real quick before we get going today, I've got to give a shout out to these guys. They're my latest patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, I'll leave a link to Patreon down in the description below. Okay, so this is one of those projects that's long overdue for myself. My current APRS Digipeter is running on a Baofeng radio and a Raspberry Pi 3, and the entire setup was built, uh, I believe it was December of 2018. And really, I just, uh, once I set it up, I haven't messed with it since then. It just sits there and does its job. So I have purchased a Yezu FT2980 uh, that's going to be replacing the Baofeng. I'm also going to be using a Signalink sound card just because I had an extra one laying around. Again, I'm going to build this on a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 3 has got plenty of horsepower to just sit there and be an APRS Digipeter. Now, this video is going to be a little bit different than uh, some of my tutorials in the past. I'm going to be wa walking you through all of the little bitty bits uh, that it, it takes to get something like this up and running. For instance, uh, I have done an APRS Digipeter video a little over a year ago, I think, if I remember right. One of the things I didn't show in that was how to auto start uh, Direwolf and Exaster in that video. So that's one of the extra little things that we'll be doing today. Let me get myself off the screen here and let's jump over to the Pi and get this thing going. Okay, so I do already have uh, the Raspberry Pi basic uh, system built with everything installed. Let me open up a text editor here. I've made myself some notes. Uh, so you can see right up here exactly, too. Well, let me center that up in the screen a little better. And you will be able to see exactly what I have uh, installed with build -Pi. So I've got the hotspot on here, hotspot tools, direwolf, AX25, Yak, and Exaster. Now, a couple of these things we could probably uh, not even worry about installing. I wanted them here just in case I wanted to do something extra with this system in the future, I would already have those tools installed. But that's what I have started with. So first thing we want to do, it's telling me that I'm still using the default password. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click OK there. And I'll go ahead and click Next on this screen here and fill in the information to let it know exactly where I am located, uh, time zones and what languages I wanna use and whatnot. Uh, once we get that information done, we'll go ahead and click Next. It takes a couple of minutes for it to set up the Raspberry Pi for the localizations that you've chosen. The next screen that we're presented with just asks us to change the password so we're not running the default password. So I'll go ahead and enter that twice and click Next. Uh, this has to do with the display of the Raspberry Pi. I don't have any uh, black border showing around my desktop, so I'm not going to put a check mark there. And it's going to start searching for wireless networks. Now I already have mine connected as part of the build a pi build, so I'm just going to click skip there. Now it wants to update the software again because I installed all of this with build a pi build -a -Pi already has the system up to date, so I can skip this as well. Uh, and then it tells me that it's ready to go. So with that taken care of, let's go ahead and open up my notes, and we'll kind of start taking a look at uh, what I'm planning on doing here. Now, one of the things, I run uh, six or seven Raspberry Pis in my shack, and I prefer to give each of them a custom background. Otherwise, it's easy to get on the wrong system. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to come up here and I'm using VNC to access this Raspberry Pi. Uh, so I'm going to use the VNC file transfer to be able to go ahead and uh, move a new background image that I have created over to the Raspberry Pi. So I'll go ahead and move that over. I'm going to just close that window, clear this and you will notice that it's put that right here on my desktop. 
So uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move that uh, background image to the appropriate spot. Tell you what, give me one second here. Let me make this a little bit larger so you guys can see what's going on a bit easier. Okay, since I put that image on the desktop, I'm going to go ahead and move to the desktop directory by using CD space desktop. Now, we're going to be copying this uh, APRS digi file right over here. Uh, that's the image that I just uploaded. We're going to be copying it to this directory right here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do that so that it's in the right place. Now, you do have to use sudo on this command because the directory we're moving it to is owned by root. Uh, so we're just going to say sudo space mv space We'll give it that file name, in this case, aprs-digi.jpg. We'll give it another space, and then we're going to give it that other path. So that's uh, forward slash USR, forward slash share, forward slash RPD hyphen wallpaper. I'll go ahead and hit return. You'll notice that it disappeared off of the desktop, and it's now in the directory that we need. So let's go ahead and change the background so that we don't get this confused with any other um, Raspberry Pis on the system. So we'll go into user and share and then I'll have to scroll down until I find that uh, RPD directory. Once you locate it in the list go ahead and double click on it to open that up. I'm going to select that aprsdigi.jpg and click open. <clears throat> That'll go ahead and change up the background so I have no issues with uh, confusing this system uh, with another one. Uh, the next thing I want to do is, and I shouldn't have closed that, so I'm going to come back down to uh, Preferences and Raspberry Pi Configuration. And I want to also change the host name. I don't want my host name to be Raspberry Pi. Again, if you've got seven Raspberry Pis on your network, it's not very helpful when all of them are named Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to call this one APRS-Digi. Now I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Uh, it is going to tell me to reboot the system. I don't want to do that right now. We'll be rebooting here in a minute anyway. Uh, so let's see. We got the host name changed. We've already done the password. Uh, the hotspot. I do want to go ahead, since I have the hotspot installed on this device, I do want to go ahead and set that name to something that's a bit more memorable. Uh, so I'm going to come up to the main Pi menu, come down to ham radio, and then hotspot tools. You'll see right here the SSID that uh, it would currently broadcast if it uh, generated a hotspot would be RPI hotspot. I'm going to just click change name and password. <clears throat> I'm going to leave the password set to what it is, but I want to change this to be, uh, let's say, APRS Digi again. That way, if I had to find that in a uh, list of Wi-Fi names, it would be easy to spot this particular machine. Again, we're going to get this uh, warning that we need to reboot to make it uh, take effect. I don't want to do that right now, so I'm going to hit cancel. But you should see right here in your SSID the new name that you just assigned to it. So let's go ahead and quit Hotspot Tools. Now, if you do run VNC, something that can be super annoying is VNC kind of logs you off automatically uh, after a set period of time when you've been idle. I prefer that it not do that. So I'm going to come right up to the VNC icon on the Raspberry Pi. Let's right click on that and let's come down to Options. Once this window opens up, let's click on the Privacy tab. And we're going to uncheck this second box here. This is disconnect users who've been idle for an extended period of time. I'm going to click apply there and then OK. OK, so now that we've kind of got the basics of the Raspberry Pi set up, let's go ahead and start taking care of a few of the things that we need for the actual APRS Digipeter. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open the file browser. And I'm going to look for this file right here, dw-start.sh. I'm going to right click on that and click text editor. Let's make this a little bit bigger for you guys. And then I'm going to click view and line numbers so I can give you guys a reference here. 
I'm going to scroll down, I believe. Uh, it's going to be right around line 45. Is that right? Yeah, 45. Where it says direwolf equals, and then it just says direwolf. What I want to leave the direwolf there, but put a space and a hyphen P right there to go with that original direwolf command. We're just going to press Control S to save that file and Control Q to close that file down. And that takes care of that. Now, there's another little odd thing that happens when Exaster gets installed that I want to go ahead and fix right now. So I'm going to open the terminal back up. We'll move back to our home directory with CD, and then I'm going to clear the screen. Anytime you need to find a file in Direwolf, uh, it's an executable file and it's in your path, you can simply type where is and the program name. So in this case, Exaster and go ahead and press return. What it returns with is this information right here, and that's the actual path to the Exaster file, but it tells me that it's in this particular directory. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to that directory with U uh, cd space forward slash usr forward slash bin. Now I'm gonna run a command here, ls space hyphen l, we're going to give it a space and the pipe symbol, and we're going to say grip exaster. And we'll wait for those uh, results to pop up. Now, I don't want to get into a uh, big tutorial here on permissions, but I do want to show you that we do have a permissions issue here. Uh, exaster is the file that we're looking for, and you can see right here at the very end, we have a dash meaning that this uh, file cannot be executed by the Pi user as it stands right now. Look at the file right below it, you'll see that that X is there, and we could execute this file if it's what we're looking for. I'm going to fix that just by going sudo space ch, uh, chmod plus x exaster. I'll go ahead and hit return. Now, if we run that ls command again, you'll notice this time that we now have an x out here at the very end, meaning the Pi user can execute Exaster. That keeps us from having to run Exaster as root, uh, and it gives us a little bit more security uh, than if we did execute that as root. So that takes care of that. Let's go look at our notes. All right, the next thing we want to do is we're going to be adding some information to our cron file. So I'll put these, uh, this information down in the description below so you guys can copy and paste this as well. But let's come over to our terminal window again. Now I just copied everything that was in that document. Uh, I'm going to clear that screen and I'm going to run cron tab space hyphen e. And it's going to ask me which editor I want to use. Well, I'm going to use the nano editor because, well, it's the easiest. So, number one, and enter. This will bring us into our cron tab. Now, you may have different things in your cron tab than what I have in mine. Uh, mine, I, I built this with build a pie and install the hotspot. So, that's what this line right here is. Whatever you have in there, come down below that uh, to the very bottom of this file. And then I'm going to right click and paste in this information that we copied from the text document. Now quickly, uh, and there are notes in here to tell you what's going on. Uh, this first command right here is simply going to reboot the Pi every day at 11 p.m. Then uh, after the reboot, or yeah, after the reboot, uh, it's going to execute this dw-start.sh file. That is a direwolf script that will go ahead and bring direwolf, uh, it, it'll start direwolf after a reboot. In addition to that, I am also going to be uh, starting Exaster after this direwolf file gets started. So you'll see a couple of sleep commands here. That just allows the system to get up and running. Uh, before we start these various uh, these various services. So I want Direwolf to start first, so I'm only sleeping for 10 seconds 
but I want to give it plenty of time to start so the next command sleeps for 90 seconds before it fires up Exaster. Once you've pasted this information in here, let's press Control S to save it and Control X. Okay, now that we've got that uh, information in the cron, now let's go ahead and reboot the system. So you can just type reboot at the command line and press enter. And I'll be right back with you guys as soon as this comes back online. Now, if everything goes according to the plan, once the system reboots, you will get this window here indicating that Direwolf has started. Then it takes a, a minute and a half before Exaster gets fired up as well. Okay, so now we can see Exaster is fired up and uh, sitting here waiting for us to configure our station. So we're just going to leave Direwolf running in the background and I'll go ahead and start with this station configuration. So right here in the top, uh, the top box where it says call sign, I'm going to enter uh, my call sign there, get it spelled correctly, and I'm going to enter my SSID. So in this case, I want it, uh, the SSID to be six. So that's KM4ACK hyphen six. Now you can also come, we're gonna skip the GPS data for right now, or the location, the Latlon location, and I'll show you guys why in a minute. Uh, if you want to change the symbol that you're seeing on the map or that you show on the map, uh, right now it's set to this X. If we click select, we can change that to any of the symbols that we see over here. Right now for the video, I'm just going to leave mine at X. Now you can also select some things here uh, to do with your antenna and your power levels to give people that see the system online a bit of data about your station. And then you'll find a comment section down here at the bottom. Uh, so if you wanted to put maybe Raspberry Pi uh, Digipeter or whatever comment you want to show up on APRS.fi and other APRS radios, you could enter that comment here. Let's go ahead and click OK. Now I'm going to make this screen uh, a lot larger here, make it easier to see things. And then I'm going to go ahead. Now, anytime you want to zoom in with Exaster, you can right click and uh, hold the, I'm sorry, you left click and hold your left mouse button down while you drag across an area and it will zoom in. Now, one of the things I don't like about Exaster is the maps, uh, especially this first display map that they show you. So we're going to start fixing that first. So I'm going to come up to the map uh, menu item here and I'm going to come down to Map Chooser. Right here, we're going to look for one called OSM underscore tiled underscore mapnik.go. That's M-A-P-N-I-K dot G-O. I'm going to highlight it and say, uh, or click Apply, and then I'll click OK. And that's going to give us a much better looking map. One other thing that really annoys me, I do not like this grid on the map. So we're going to click the map item again, come down to where it says enable map grid, and I'm going to uncheck the little box beside uh, that and get rid of it. Now, I want to zoom in. I know I'm in Tennessee, so I'm going to zoom in uh, to the state of Tennessee, and I hit something accidentally there. Let's see if we can close that. Yeah, there we go. And it will go ahead and start zooming in. Now, it does have to download the map tiles. Whoa, that did not work out the way I expected. Let's see if I can get that squared away here. Okay, so I'm not real sure how I fat fingered that, but somehow or another I had to, uh, I got zoomed in really close and I had to click the zoom out button about 19 different times to get back to this level. Uh, these buttons right up here, the in, out, and these four arrows, will allow you to zoom in and move your map around. Now, I want to show you guys one other thing that I use all the time, uh, and that's different map bookmarks. So right now I've got this set so that the state of Tennessee is in full view. So I'm going to come up to Map and Map Display Bookmarks, the second option down. I'm going to set this or uh, name this T-E-N-N -N for Tennessee and click Add. Now I can just close that window. What I want to do is I want to keep zooming in, uh, so I know this is my city here, Murfreesboro, 
but I want to keep zooming in until I can see uh, my home QTH where I'm located right now. Uh, so let's see, there's one there. I'm going to click that map down uh, one time so I can kind of center Murfreesboro up. And I'm going to go ahead and click the map and map display bookmarks. And I'm going to set that for Murfreesboro and say add. All right, now let's see if we can get zoomed in a little closer. I know that my home QTH is right up in this area. So I'm going to zoom in one more time. Now that I'm able to see a street level view, I'm going to pick wherever on the map I want my station to locate. And I'm going to right click, come down to move my station here. I'm going to click on that and I'm going to click the button that pops out, move my station here. And you'll notice now it has placed me on the map. Now, real quick, let's go back to where it, uh, to file, configure, and station. And you'll notice it has entered the GPS coordinates for us. So that's why I skipped it in the very beginning. To me, it's a lot easier just to right click on the map and go ahead and place your station. Now, we need to go ahead and set up two different things. I want this to be a Digipeter and an iGate. Uh, so the Digipeter will repeat any signals it hears over RF. Uh, and it will also, by setting up the iGate, it will send those APRS packets into the internet as well. You can configure one or the other or both. Both is preferable so that we have the most capabilities in the station as possible. So let's come up to the interface inner tab here. And let's come down to interface control. Once we see the interface control box, I'm going to click add and we'll get another new box here. I'm going to come down to serial kiss TNC. I'm going to highlight that and click add and we get yet another pop-up box. Along the top line here, uh, activate on startup is already checked. Allow transmitting is already checked. I want to check Digipeat as well. Now, we need to know our TNC port. I'm going to go back to the Direwolf window, and you'll see right here our TNC port is this information right here. So that's forward slash dev, forward slash PTS, forward slash one. And I'm going to go ahead and enter that into the TNC port here. Once you've got that entered, I'm going to leave the port settings at default, which is 4800 BPS. The next option down is my, or the next box down is my iGate options. And I'm going to choose this one here, which allows RF to the internet and internet to RF. I'm going to leave uh, the path set to default and the KISS parameters also set to default. We'll go ahead and click OK here. Once it dumps us back to our interface control box, I'm going to highlight this and click start. And you'll see that down has turned to up right here. So that should be the radio side of it configured. Now let's configure the internet side of it real quick. Let's click the add button one more time and let's choose internet server. After we've chosen internet server, go ahead and click add and we're presented with a much smaller pop-up box uh, on this one. So activate on startup should be checked as well as allow transmitting. The one thing we do need, and I'm going to leave the uh, host and the port at default. The one thing we do need is our passcode. Now I'll show you two different ways to get this passcode. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new instance of the terminal window and I'm going to type call pass C-A-L-L-P-A-S-S, -S, all one word, space, and I'm going to give it my call sign. In your case, please use your own call sign. Go ahead and hit return, and it gives me the passcode of 20389. Now, if you choose to use exast uh, I'm sorry, if you choose to use Yak instead of Exaster, you would not have this call pass uh, program installed, and you wouldn't be able to run that. If that is the case for you, you can come right over to this website right here. And I'll leave a link to this down in the description below. If I plug in my call sign right here and click Submit, 
you'll see that I get the same call pass number. So either way you want to go with it, whether you do it on the website or whether you do it in the terminal window, both ways will give you the same uh, results. So now that we know that uh, my call pass is 20389, let's just close this window. I'm going to come back to this configure internet box and where it asks for the passcode, enter 20389. We'll go ahead and click OK. I'm going to highlight that uh, device one and you'll see it says down there. As soon as we click the start button, that should change to up. Uh, and it didn't. And I got an error. So let's see. Let's try clicking the start button one more time and see if we can get that uh, to start this time. Okay, there we go. Not sure what happened the first time. May have just been a glitch in my uh, local network here, not allowing me out to the internet. But both devices now show up. We can close this window here. Now, I'm going to grab my uh, HT, and I'm just going to go ahead and send out a beacon, uh, an APRS beacon. And when that beacon comes through, you'll see it right there on the screen. So that tells me that uh, I'm able to receive just fine. Uh, so it looks like everything is coming in and being fed over to Exaster without any issue. Now, one more quick test I'm going to run. Inside of Exaster, I'm going to click Message and Send Message To. And I'm going to give it my call sign hyphen 7, which is my HT's uh, SSID. And we'll just say test for video. Now, let's see. Can I hold this up so you can watch it and click the Send Now button and see if we can get that to populate uh, in the radio. Uh, yep, I've got the white flashing light. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that to... I'm trying to look at two different monitors here to make sure I've got that in the screen. Uh, let's see. Let me get back to... Um, the message list and I'll go ahead and open up that message and now I believe you should be able to see that on the camera. So uh, it looks like everything is working. The receive is working. Um, we know that it picked up my HT and then the transmit is working uh, because when I sent the test message out I did receive it over RF at the HT. So there you have it. I know this is a bit longer video than we normally do, but I wanted to cover a lot of different information in this and kind of show you all of the bits that it takes to put one of these stations together. Hopefully uh, this will cut down on some of the questions like, well, how do I get this to auto start uh, when the Raspberry Pi reboots? Hopefully this will take care of everything you need to know about setting up your APRS DigiPeter. Be sure to give us a thumbs up before you head off. We'll see you guys on the next video. Until then, 7-3.